Um, let's talk about Sunstone for a bit. Okay. So as my understanding is Sunstone was started in the mid-70s by Scott Kinney and Peggy Fletcher Stack right. and a couple other people. Started out as a magazine. Right. And then it started doing the symposium. Right. And it started really growing in the 80s. Right. So where does your brother come into that? He came in, um, he started with Sunstone in 78. And I should tell people who don't know Sunstone. Oh, sorry, is not this, 70. That's wrong. Go no, ahead. Sunstone's a forum of like it was, Mormon history, of Mormon art, of Mormon culture, of intellectual Mormon, Mormon intellectual thought. And so it was a place for us to be thoughtful and progressive and intellectual and look, figure out true church history. And it kind of came on the, you know, uh, along with the Leonard Arrington Camelot years of the church history, you know, renaissance and in the church trying to be more open and honest with its history before it shut all that da back down again. Right. So a lot of the research being done by the Arringtons and Michael Quinn and all those people would make it into Sunstone as well as Dialogue right. magazine. Dialogue, yeah. So for those who don't know, that's the brief history. So, right. so, so your brother gets involved with Sunstone. Yeah, it's 1986 so, to 91. Okay, That's when so he kind was of mid -80s, mid eighties on the board. He was the uh, he was the publisher editor. Okay, so just, so Albert Peck would have been the editor right. at that time. Let's he see. he followed Peggy Fletcher Albert Stack, Peck. Albert Peck, yep. and um, Linda Jean Stevenson was there. And know. and there was a time in Sunstone. So imagine like this conference that everybody would go attend once a year in Salt Lake City mm -hmm. at some hotel or University of Utah. I don't know where they would have held it back then. But before Sunstone got denounced, BYU professors would have gone there. Church and church education system, CES Institute, and seminary directors would have gone. Oh, yeah. It would have been everybody that was going, just trying to celebrate Mormon culture and talk about intellectual issues and right. and just really apply intellectual rigor and and cultural spirit towards their Mormon experiences. Exactly. So okay, yeah. so. So maybe when your brother would have originally got involved, later there were denouncements where, you know, Mormons were – where Sunstone was kind of denounced yeah. and people were warned not to attend. Right. And they were told to avoid symposia. Right. But my guess is your brother would have joined before those denouncements. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But while your dad was alive and a general authority. Yeah. So did your, did your dad – like originally read Sunstone? Did he like it? Would your brother have had any indication that it was okay to do that? Was he was it an act of rebellion? Do you remember mm -hmm. as your brother's getting into this how your dad felt about it and whether your dad knew and all that? Yeah. Well, he my dad knew and when Dan was getting involved with it, at like you said at first it was it was pretty benign. Um I don't think my dad thought anything bad about it. And he was already um, – there was an intellectual movement going on, and, and Dan would bring that stuff home and, and talk to my dad about it and my older brother, Kirk. They'd really get into it. And John got into it later too. But they would have these conversations, and uh, Dan's wife, Lisa, was there, and we'd, he'd bring people over. Like I said, the Toscanos were coming over, and my dad loved it. I mean, he loved Paul Toscano, and they'd laugh and laugh and have a great time. And then we had Andy E. Hat was there a lot. Um, there were other people, uh, Eugene England. Um, and so my dad was involved in th in the beginnings of it and enjoying it. It was all very interesting to him. And he had this thing about wanting to find truth. You know, truth was important to him. So if it was true, he wanted to know. And um, But this was stuff that wasn't really... The brethren weren't talking about it. It wasn't being told talked about over the pulpit. It was sort of, you know, this side group that was doing this. And so then when the brethren got wind of what was happening, that there was a movement going on and people were going to the Sunstone Symposium, and then when they started checking out what was printed in the magazine, that some of it was controversial and didn't necessarily shine a really great light on the church, um, and I think the Tanners were bringing stuff into it, too. Like, they were leaking They're always stuff. in the mix. They're always yeah. in the mix, yeah. So, you know, then there was, like, a red flag that the brethren were like, whoa, 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 what, what's going on over here? What, what are you talking about? What are you saying? And when that started happening, Boyd K. Packer started really pressuring my dad. Get your son out of it. Get the name because my dad, his name was Daniel Hartman Rector. 
<laughs> so they're like, we don't want your son having anything to do with that. That gives us a bad, you know, the people will connect that, and it, we don't want to be connected with it. And there's there's this very Mormon thing, which is like, well, if Hartman Rector's son's involved, it must be okay. Yeah. Because in Let's Mormonism, go read it. yeah, authority trumps all, right? Right, so. right, exactly. So, yeah, so they're trying to shut it down. And uh, and Dan was like, no, 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 no. I, you know, the church needs this. We need this forum for people to express their feelings because we can't do it in Sunday school. We can't do it in sacrament meeting. We can't. When can we do that? When can we talk about these things? We need a place. So he was, you know, sticking up for it, you know, quite with my dad and they were going back and forth. My dad was saying, I know, I know you feel this way, but this is really putting me in a bad, a really bad situation. And I, and I just really need you to just back out. And he wanted him to shut it down. Dan's like, I'm not going to shut it down. I, I don't have the power to shut it down, and and I'm not going to leave. Do you know what the role what, – what does the publisher do? Do you even know? Do you remember? I, I don't know. I, okay. I wouldn't be able to tell you okay. these were That's his fine. jobs. That's fine. But he was there. I mean, he was so involved. He was always there at all the – you know, in symposium. He went there every day. To, you know, that was his job. Was and it's, it's, this, it's this house that's – on the same road the the Vivid Center's on, right? Yeah. In, in kind of North Salt Lake. Right. Where the Sunstone offices still are. Yep. They had and have a house there. Yeah. And there would be all these, photo, would hang out. all these photos on the wall mm -hmm. and couches. And oh, yeah. it was He loved it. Like, it was like the center up. of intellectual life exactly. for Mormonism. Exactly. Yeah, it's kind of sacred ground in me a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. And there was all these, you know, people were coming out of the woodwork. These, these, there were there were BYU people, like you said, that were professors that knew things, and you know they'd done their homework, and they were like, hey, you know, Joseph Smith actually did this, you know, and I, I don't know if you know this, but this was happening, and we well, check out this about the Book of Abraham, you know, and so all that stuff was coming to light, and I would hear my brother and my dad talking about it at the house. I started to tell you that they would have these conversations all the time and I would listen in. And I mean, I heard all the stories about Emma and Joseph and the wives and, you know, Emma pushed somebody down the stairs. Eliza Snow, Eliza, I think, yeah. Yeah, who was her best friend who was now, I heard, allegedly pregnant right. with Joseph's child. Right. And, you know, all these all this stuff that I'd never heard before. And I didn't even know Joseph Smith practiced polygamy, let alone, you know, with many times behind Emma's back. I did not know this. And with other men's wives. When I heard that, my mind was blown. I was, whoa, I've heard polygamy. This is something different. Now we're doing, these women had more than one husband. You now know? you heard this in the 80s? Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. And, and so I read, I, my dad... I asked him about it. He said, go read section 132. You know, that's what he told me to <laughs> Which do. Which doesn't help at all. No. And I read it and I was <laughs> furious. You know, I'm like, what? <laughs> you know, so I said, so you're telling me that Emma got like threatened <laughs> that if she didn't go along with it, she was going to be destroyed. Why? <laughs> you know, this is wrong. This is so wrong. You know, and, and I was and he was like, you know, don't worry about this stuff. We don't live polygamy anymore. You just. Go home and read your Book of Mormon and say your prayers and, you know, be a mom. You just <laughs> and, and I'd be like, yeah, but, but this is our founder, like our prophet, Joseph Smith. He was supposed to be righteous, and he's doing this stuff, you know. And, and my dad really just said, well, we don't even know if this is all true. This is, you know, this is hearsay. It's anti-Mormon propaganda. You know, don't stress out about it. Just go live your, you know, gospel. So that kind of, it kind of satisfied me for a while. And I. So he thought it was anti Mormon propaganda, not, not factual history? Well, that's what he told me. Okay. I don't know if that's what he thought. I just know that's what he told me when okay. I was getting all up in arms about it. He was like, oh, no, you know, don't worry about this. Where, but I could still hear him talking with my brothers, and he sounded like he knew it, that it was actually true. The way they would argue about it. He never said, that's not true. He would be like, well, you know, back in the day, those things, times were different. You know, they had different rules. And Joseph Smith was a product of his environment. And we don't know what that was like because we none of us ever lived that. You know, I'd, I'd hear them talking about this. And, you know, they talked about the stone. And they talked about the seer stone. They talked about the treasure digging. 
um, you know, how he would make money off of people treasure digging but never really find treasure. And that he would make up these stories about how the treasure, treasure disappeared, right? So then, and I'm reading the Book of Mormon all the time. And so I'm seeing stuff in the Book of Mormon, like the part about the slippery treasures in the Book of Mormon, where they would, he'd say, if you buried your treasure, it would slip yeah. away, become slippery. A lot of that folk magic treasure digging stuff that Joseph believed and practiced time, made it in made it into the coincidentally book. made it in the book of mormon dan vogel talks a lot about this. yes yeah. so i've listened to all of dan Vo like all of his stuff i think i've listened to every podcast he's ever done or youtube video but at the time this is way back in the 80s right so i'm hearing this stuff for the first time and i'm being told oh no 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 but from my dad don't worry about it it's anti-mormon but then i'm seeing the correlations in the actual Book of Mormon. And I'm thinking, you know, that's really interesting because if polygamy, if they were practicing polygamy, why does it say in Jacob that, that it's wrong? That it's, that, what do you call it? Uh, um, I can't, uh, abomination. Whoredom, abomination. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and so that didn't quite line up for me. And I was like, how do you reconcile DNC 132 with, James in the Book of Mormon. So or there, Jacob, yeah. Jacob. Yeah. So there's all these little things, you know, and like I, I just put them on the shelf. Put them on the shelf. I'll think about that later. I got to go cook dinner. I got to do wash. I got to take care of my kids. I don't have time for this, but they bothered me. They just ate away at my little brain. And so flash forward, you know, I don't know where you want to go next, but. But they didn't bother your dad. No, he seemed to be mm -hmm. able to. I mean, you would never have known it. If he if it bothered him, I never saw him look one bit perplexed. He just carried on with the program. Right. You know, doing his thing. They had him flying all over the world. He was busy. He was go, 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 go. And um, he never seemed to be, uh, you know, one bit bothered by it. Other than he wanted my brother to quit. He wanted, some, he wanted him to stop being associated. So did your brother quit? He finally did. But it was after, let's see, so 91. He, it was in did, 91. Did I read he was disfellowshipped or had yeah. a church? Dis so talk about why was there a disciplinary council and how did that happen and who did he talk to and who did it and okay. how was your dad involved and all that? I don't know about who did the disciplinary council. I believe it was his stake president. Yeah, it would have been. But So, and I don't even know who that was. But he, so, he was a Sunday school teacher also. And so some of his Sunstone stuff found its way into his Sunday school class teaching. So when he would talk like that, people in the class would be bothered and they would go talk to the bishop. Hey, you know, why is he talking about that? And this is, is this, you know, what's going on? So he got in trouble for that. They kicked him out of his calling. And then they knew he was involved with Sunstone. So when they started um, interviewing the, everybody that was involved with Sunstone, he got called in. Oh, and he also had stopped paying tithing because he he didn't believe that it was, you know, what we've been taught. He didn't think we should. So when he stopped paying tithing and they kicked him out of his calling, then they took his temple recommend away. And so then he and, and that may have been part of his disciplinary action. But I believe that he was not excommunicated with the rest of the September 6 because he because of my dad. That's my belief. I don't know that, but I, that's my belief. That's why he didn't get thrown out with the rest of them. So was he disfellowshipped before or after the September 6th? At the same time. I think it happened right along with. But not excommunicated. But not excommunicated. Because your dad covered for him or whatever. Yeah. Okay. So. Okay. Yeah. And how did that affect your dad's relationship with your brother? Was that hard? Um, was it fine? Yeah. I mean, he loved Dan. Um, it was hard not to love Dan. He was just a good guy. I think he, Is Dan alive? No. Okay. You mentioned. He, he passed away in 2003 in a hiking accident. Mm. So, um, yeah, my dad and Dan were very close and he didn't, he was not angry with him. I think he felt bad, but I really think that he pulled the strings to keep him from being excommunicated. I think that was part of the deal because it was, I mean, Packer called my brother on the phone 
and threatened him. Said what? Said, you need to shut this down or else. You need to leave Sunstone or, you know, try to close the whole thing down. And Dan said, I, I, I can't. I won't. And he, and he issued an apostolic curse on him. What? He said that he would reap... He would reap, oh, Dan, John, help me. He would reap adversity mm. all the days of his life because he did not follow um, uh, Packer's request and admonition. Because you will not follow my apostolic admonition, I am going to give you, leave you with an apostolic curse. And that's mm. what he did. So, did, did you have a sense for whether your brother stop believing and thought the church was a fraud or whether he still believed or whether he was a liberal Mormon or like what was his belief state by the time he's disfellowshipped? Yeah. I think uh, worst case, well, it depends on how you look at it. I, I think there were times when he did not believe. I think that he learned enough stuff that he realized that it wasn't true. But in order to save face with my his family, my dad, not so much his family, Siblings, maybe, but not his wife. His wife was already not believing. She didn't. She was out. Um, he, I think he wanted to stay in. And so when he died, he was an active member. He had a temple recommend back. He was teaching gospel doctrine. Oh, he again. came back. He yeah. came back in the full fellowship. Yeah. So, you know, you could argue, well, was he a nuanced believer? Like, what? where was he really in his head? And... You know, all all I know is that he was back going to church, but he knew everything. So I kind of wonder how he reconciled that. So you, you never had the conversation with him where he says, Lyle, I don't, I don't believe anymore. The church is a fraud. Not with me, but he may have with John and he may have with other people. I never heard him say that to me. He would never have done that because it would have hurt my faith. And, and he was not, he wouldn't have done that with me. Did it affect how you viewed him to know that he was disfellowshipped and was doing something scary and edgy? No, no. No, I loved him. I, I admired him for it. I thought he was brave. I really did. I thought he was gutsy and, I mean, even though my dad told me not to worry about it, like I said, it, deep down inside in your the pit of your stomach, when you know something's not right, you can feel it. I knew. I knew there was something to it. I knew Daniel knew something. there was something to it. And I admired him for his courage to persevere right on through. I mean, he did end up leaving Sunstone. Um, but I know why he did it. He did it for my dad. He did it for my dad. John, John chimes in and says that the term, it was reap adversity all the days of his life. Yeah. Does that sound right? Yeah. Reap adversity. <laughs> Thank you, Boyd. Thanks a lot. <laughs> yeah. And then he died young. So, you you know, you're left oh, going, hmm. Oh, no. But he didn't have adversity all the days of his life. He had, he had a great marriage. He had a great life. He enjoyed life to the fullest. That guy was outside loving the world. He, I don't think he reaped adversity at all. He died young. And, you know, that leaves you wondering, <laughs> what, yeah. Just apostles don't be issuing apostolic curses. curses. Like, that's just awful. <laughs> Stop. Bad behavior. Yeah. My dad always said that um, Boyd K. Packer was not nice. He said that about him. He said yeah. some of them are nice and some of them are not, and he is not nice. I wonder if your dad struggled with the church disfellowshipping his son. I wonder how he personally felt about that. Yeah. If he felt like my son deserves it because he won't obey me or, wow, I wish the church would leave him alone. Yeah. I would say more the latter. I think he, you know, he just really <clears throat> adored Dan. He did. And I, I think he was hurt by it. It wasn't enough for him to leave. It wasn't enough for him to say, you know, the church is not true anymore or anything like that. I think he was just, you know, just sad about it. Oh, that's so hard. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm always kind of amazed at how people, and I was thinking about this today, and it came up on, on the Facebook page podcast, yeah. Mormon Stories Facebook page. Um, somebody commented something about how some people are able to stay in the church, even if it's a nuanced version of, of staying in and believing, 
they they somehow are able to change the words and the meanings of words to allow them to sit in those buildings and and stay. And they were being critical of that, you know. And I thought about my dad. I thought about my brother. Um, my oldest brother left. He bailed. He left the country. He he's gone. He's in lives in Moscow half the year, and uh, and he lives in Thailand the other half of the year. And he left the church. He left his family. Just completely left. He went kind of off the rails a little bit, but um, you know he clearly didn't believe the church was true. And I think he lost his testimony during the whole Hoffman era and the Sunstone era. You know when they were in their heyday. So, but some people stay. You know, and I stayed. I stayed for a long time. I just this just barely happened a year ago. Like I stopped going to church in January of 2019. Yeah, I can't wait to get to that. Yeah. But people stay. I just have to say just personally that, uh, you know, some of the nicest compliments I've ever received are like when Jeremy Runnels says there'd be no CES letter without Mormon stories or right. Stephanie Larson says there'd be no Encircle without Mormon stories. There would be no Mormon stories without Sunstone. Mm. Like when I, Interesting. you know, when I was at BYU, uh, that's when I first started reading Sunstone. So this is back in 93. The September 6th happens while I'm at uh, BYU. Yeah. So that seeds my mind. Right. And I even have professors that would assign Sunstone or Dialogue-like articles to us. Uh, and they wow. had been influenced by Sunstone. Yeah. So that was sort of the early intellectual awakening for mm -hmm. me. Um, but then when I had my faith crisis uh, at Microsoft, let's just say 2000, 2001, and the internet exists at this point, the first thing I do is Google... Sunstone, because I remembered Sunstone. I'm yeah. like, I wonder if Sunstone's on the internet because there's no support. Right. And just weirdly, they had at some point, I'm going to guess 2003, uh, the September 6th would have given like a talk, some talks at Sunstone mm -hmm. uh, about like 10 years later. What's it like to be right. in the September 6th? And so it would have been Levina and Michael Quinn and Paul Toscano and Maxine Hanks and yeah. those people. And I would have seen those like on the internet and I would have just been like, oh my gosh, those people, like now that I'm losing my faith, that's why they all got excommunicated yeah, back then. And yeah. there was a good reason. And right. so all like I, in the 2000s and 2010s, you know, there are a bunch of us who are trying to do this work. I can't imagine what it would be like trying to do this work in the 80s and early 90s. Like yeah. on the one hand, it was weirdly more accepted in culture to be doing this edgy yeah. Mormon historical stuff, but it soon got to be not really just controversial, upon. but intensely yeah. uh, unacceptable to the top leaders of the church. Exactly. So I just can't imagine the heat that your brother and others, yeah. like they're kind well, of they, heroes. They added that into the Temple Recommend <clears throat> interview. Like, are you associating with, yeah. yeah. Like they with, put that right in there. If and the church issued those statements, stay away from symposia, right. stay away from And the you know, intellectual study movement, and, yeah, you know, they the wanted so -called us all intellectuals. to be, yeah. Boyd K. Packer says that the three great enemies to the church are the gays, the feminists, and the intellectuals. Like yeah. that's a whole right. period of our history that's really troublesome and dark. Unbelievable that he said that. I mean, Wow. But it's also super courageous of your brother to have been right there in the middle of yeah. it and and carrying that torch back at a time where it must have been really hard. Yeah, they didn't really have anybody else to go to. Like, you had them. I had you. They didn't have anybody to go to and lean on and, and to kind of pave the way for them. And um, they were leaning on each other, you know, and the people that were coming out of BYU that were— you know, there was controversy going on at BYU, and I remember this. There's Gail Houston, Cecilia Farr, right. David Knowlton. Right. All these professors are getting fired right. for talking about feminism, talking about pro-choice, talking about praying to a mother in heaven, talking about phallic symbols in the church or publishing articles in Substone. All that. And talking about We're the talking age about of the earth. Age you know? of the earth, science, yeah. missionaries getting blown up in Peru and, and terrorists. and right. And the church just got uncomfortable yeah, with all that. Yeah, real uncomfortable, real fast. And they're firing people. And so, like, that's kind of when I was at BYU that was going on. So, I mean, all these things, there's all these movements that and, – and, you know, I'm just being the dutiful mom raising a family. I mean, that's really what I was doing, going to church every week, 
paying my tithing, reading my scriptures every night. I read the Book of Mormon probably more than anyone else on the planet. I have read that book so many times. It's embarrassing. There's a lot of good things in the book, but there's also, you know, just a lot of stuff that doesn't need to be there that wasn't necessary, you know, wars and and money and, you know, what they're called their money, just, just all kinds of weird things. But anyway, my, I guess my point is just that I was not, focusing on what was going on around me with my brother. I, was, I mean, I knew what was happening, but I wasn't like really focusing on it. I was focusing on just doing my duty as a mother and as a wife. And I, I mean, I had a really hard marriage. I had way more kids than I knew what to do, what to do with and uh, callings, you know, and, and I was busy. And I wish that I had been just a little more involved in reading what was out there, what people were talking about, because now I'm playing catch up. You've read all these books and, and I'm like writing them down. Okay, I got to read that. I got to read that. I got to read that. And, and I've read a lot, but I've, I'm scratching the surface barely. Yeah. And you were there at the center of it. That yeah. must be hard that you not yeah. only were at the center of it and didn't really fully absorb it. Right. But then you went on to live a couple more decades in the oh, church. Yeah. Yeah. And now you're just kind of realizing mm -hmm. what your family was kind of at the center of. Exactly. But, and there's just another element to that, which is now, you know, whether it's feminism or Mormon stories or, you know, church history or LGBT stuff or, you know, we're winning. Like the church is hearing us now. Yeah. People are leaving. We're all vindicated. The church is changing. Yeah. Like, and, and there's this massive defection of people leaving the church. Yeah. The difference is back then they were doing the same types of things without the internet. Right. And they lost. Yeah. They kind of got gobsmacked. They did. Put back in their place and had to run or want to run away. Yeah. With their tails between their legs. And there was like this 10 year period of just total silence and fear. Yeah. And they got smacked back into their holes. They really did. And 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 marginalized and and shamed and so and, much, yeah. so much. They were the evil. They were the antichrist. They were the, you know, stay away from anything anti Mormon or intellectual. So yeah, I mean, it was rough for them. And I think with the advent of the internet, they came out of their holes a little bit. Yeah, and thought, I can actually have a voice without, and I can stay anonymous somewhat. You know. No, we can really. Well, they, you still got it though. They still found you. Oh no, no, no. The, a lot of us, like John Larson and me and Lindsay and others, yeah. yeah, we we we've never really been anonymous. Right. No, I w I didn't mean anonymous, mm. meaning not seen and your names not being out. I just mean you could hide a little bit more behind your your computer. Oh right, right. You know, it's a little more safe. Right. Somehow. Right, and you can do more too. Yeah. You can affect more people. And there's way more information that yeah. you can grab. So, Okay, so I want to get to your story. Okay. Is there anything else that we want to talk about with your, your dad and your mom just in terms of their lives or your, you know, your family's lives before we just go right to you and your marriage and your okay. kids? And Yeah. Well, I, I – okay. First of all, I was from a large family. There's nine kids. One, one's adopted, eight natural kids. Um, and my mom had us really spread out. So like my oldest brother is 15 years older than me. My youngest sister is 12 years younger than me, you know, so there's a big span. Wow. My mom had two kids after the age, after she had, no, she had one kid after she had four grandkids. So Lucy oh was goodness. like on the tail end, you know, when my mom was 46. So big family. So there are grandkids they're, they're kids older than their uncles. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or aunts. Aunt. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So that's kind of weird. A good LDS family. Yeah, <laughs> that's a really right? Good. <laughs> and, and so, I mean, that was all part of my my world was, you know, having a big family. And um, we were close-knit. Everybody loves everybody. But very diverse. But, you know, everybody loved everybody. So um, when my brother Kirk left, that was a shock to my family. Shocked my dad. My dad was furious, furious. I've heard my dad yell and scream like many times, but never quite to that volume as he did when my brother left and he got on the phone and just chewed him out for what he did because he left his kids, left the church, 
Left his wife? Left his wife, left the country. What year around? What year? Do you remember? I know it's putting you on the spot. Uh, mm. Okay, I was married, so it's got to be 82, 83. Okay, so this is before your brother's disfellowshipped. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. One, one, one domino falls. Right. Okay. So he's gone, and he does not believe the church at all. He's completely just over it. And um, and so and he disappears from the family. Well, kind does of. Does he still come to din- does he still come to dinners? Does he still come to reunions? Does he? He came to one f- or two family reunions, but now he can't come into the country at all because he owes taxes oh. in the United States. Okay. So he's in Russia. But I mean, were you, was he ostracized from your parents? Did they want him around? Did they not want no, him around? They, they wanted him around. Okay, okay. My parents have never ostracized. They don't believe in that. Okay. But my dad will give him hell. Okay. You know, if he's around, he's he's gonna chew him out mm. probably for hours on end. But he's not going to ostracize. Okay, okay. So did that make your brother not want to come around, or did he come around um, anyway? I probably kept him from coming. Okay. Quite a bit. Yeah. But he would come, you know, on occasion, and and he joined right in with us when we were having church, you know, on in Aspen Grove or at our family reunion. He'd be there, you know, saying the prayer, and, and even though he didn't believe in any of it, singing the hymns, you know. So and was there like in the family like he's a bad guy or he's doing kinda, bad things or he's a lost little bit. or okay yeah kind of lost okay because he he kind of went out badly you don't just abandon your family yeah. that's just not cool right right so that was really hurtful to his kids to his wife it was awful to your parents so, to my parents yeah. your brother suggested that this may be a nineteen ninety nineteen ninety really John maybe. Yeah, but he could be right. He could be right. That, I'm would, have really bad the, with that would have been after the disfellowship. That okay. would have been after. Okay. No, 93. No, no, no. no it was still before. It was still Three before. years before. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we had a big family mm-hmm. reunion in 1990. There's a picture, and he's there. Okay. But I thought that he might have come back. But anyway, it okay. doesn't matter. So there's Kirk goes away, and then, you know, Daniel passes away in 2003. Um, that was really tough. My dad, I mean, that really was hard on him. Uh, it was just, he was 46, he was young, had a family of four kids and a wife. And, you know, when he died, it was just really heartbreaking. And then, and then I think the next person to leave the nest as far as the gospel goes might have been John or Lucy. No, I think it was John. I think he went first and Lucy maybe at the same time, a younger sister. So these dominoes are falling. Yeah. Yeah, and it, and part of it is because you know it's that time of the world. I think people are waking up, so not everybody wants to stay anesthetized, if I can say that word. Sorry, I hit that um, by religion, and I think it's kind of happening on a global scale. Would you not agree? Yeah, it's happening. Yeah. So, you know, part of it's that, part of it's our upbringing, you know, very, very orthodox. And so you want to rebel at some point. You're like, hey, what do I even believe this? And then when you read stuff, you're like, wow, I never was taught that. And this is not healthy. This is bad. You know, I, yeah. So John was gone before me, maybe five years before me. Lucy also. Um, She moved away, um, married a guy, and they just, they went to the temple, got married, and never went back to the temple and they were sparsely active, and she just sort of fell off. And as your other siblings are leaving, what are your parents saying, or how are they reacting to it? Are they, is your dad emeritus by this point? Mm-hmm. Yeah, dad was kind of unaware. Like, I don't, I don't think anyone ever came to him and announced, well, maybe Kirk did, but not Dan or, or John or Lucy. They didn't come and say, hey, dad, we've left the church. And he's getting older now, and so it's like what he doesn't know won't hurt him. We'll just kind of do our own thing, live our own lifestyle. We're not going to announce anything to dad. Like, I got a divorce, and I didn't tell him for two years. What? And he was at my house every Sunday. Holy. We played happy family. We got to go back to that. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so there's that. Okay, so he didn't totally know your siblings are falling away. Right. He knew about Kirk, but not not anyone else. Okay. And he knew about the thing with Dan. And that's weird when when – your dad's a leader. The church is the most important thing in your family. Yeah. Kids are leaving, but they're not comfortable telling their own parents. Like, you know, right. something's wrong in the organization. Yeah, when, when you can't Whenever be kids honest. can't talk to their parents about important right. things, there's something desperately wrong. Yeah. And he was such a Republican, too. He was so 
I mean, politically, he was very, very outspoken and very dogmatic. And so when John, you know, voted for Obama and told my dad that, that was this huge argument. And so John just learned, hey, you know what? I don't need to tell dad everything. Yeah. It's if we, if we want to have a nice relationship. So I'm going to lay low. And I don't know if my dad ever, maybe he knew. John, you'll have to tell us. John Did, described it as the quiet fade out. Yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> the quiet fade out. So, yeah. so let's go back and talk about your marriage. So okay. you, you met a cute guy, mm -hmm. right? How it's just a, Okay. R I'll brief that for yeah, you. Yeah. Really briefly. I was 18. My parent, we just finished up in San Diego. My s older sister lived in upstate California. So we drove up California and went to visit her before we headed back to Salt Lake. She had arranged me to meet someone in her neighborhood, in her ward. So I get there and, and she's lined me up with this guy and I meet him and, you know, I'm there for uh, nine days. I stay with her. My, my parents go on back. I stay with my sister and I date this guy the whole time I was there. Every day we did something. And um, I was still really young. He was 22, home from his mission and very much a Hartman Rector Jr. fan. Big time. Had all my dad's talks on tape. Had listened to him all through his mission. He was like a total fan of my dad. So... Because I was the daughter, I was already, like, prime real estate for him. I mean, he wanted <laughs> – I really think that's why he married me. Yes, he – we had, you know, a relationship, and, and I do think he loved me, but I think my dad was the big draw. So um, – and I was just, you know, all enamored with him. He was I – th I thought I was, you know, crazy about him. And I was 18, so I was very young. So you did feel like you were in love? Mm hmm Okay. So we got married, and um, that was right out of high school for me. You know, I was— Wow. I had started BYU, but I was only—we got married in April, and I had started in, in, what, September. So, you know, I was not even done with my first semester at BYU. And um, we got married in the temple. My dad married us. It was all very storybook in that way. Um, we started having kids right away. I dropped out of college to raise kids. Um, we had a rocky marriage right from the start. And I would say probably my fault, a lot of it, because I was not. You were impudent. I was no, impudent. I'm, I'm sorry. No, I don't mean seriously. That. Oh. You were dead on. Oh. <laughs> he was kind of a. Uh, he was very much orthodox, and I was a little bit edgy. Just, you know, I just was, like I told you, I was open minded. I wasn't a by the book girl, and he thought I was going to be like my dad, who he thought my dad was, and I really wasn't. I was more just a little bit. Uh, I was outspoken. I would challenge him. I didn't agree with everything he said. I would stand my ground. He didn't like that. So we would fight a lot. And, you know, I'm not going to, I don't want to say anything to disparage my husband, my ex-husband, because he was a really good man, a great man. My kids loved their dad. He's a good man. We did not get along. And, and that was, you know, some of it was immaturity on both of our parts. You know, as we grew up and kind of became more aware of our own weaknesses and own problems. We kind of had to come to Jesus. Like we had a separation for a while. I moved home. Um, you know, it was abusive, the relationship. I'll just say that. That's enough. Um, it was abusive. And when I, you know, I went home, my dad gave me a blessing. He said, let's find out what the Lord thinks about your marriage, you know. And he said, <laughs> <laughs> that's how he would preface it, you know. He gave me a blessing and he said, you're going to go back. You're going to um, stay married for the, mm -hmm. the sake of your children. We had two children at the time. He said, you're going to stay married for the sake of your children. You're going to stand by him. You're going to be a great wife. You're going to you know, do this, do that. Everything's going to be great. And he said, and then one day when the Lord sees fit, you'll be given another companion. Whoa. Yeah. So I'm thinking, okay, I'll go back, put in a couple of years. <laughs> you know, I had no idea what he meant. But you're being sent back into a relationship yeah. that for you is abusive. Yes. 
sent back. And so many, and that, it, there's thousands of stories that I've heard yeah. of church leaders sending Saying spouses that. back into abusive yeah. relationships. That's what he did. Yeah. And this was his admonition, live together in love. That's all he had to say. He just said, live together in love. He's like, hey, I did it with my wife. You yeah. can do it with yours. Like, exactly. Yeah. He had no idea how deep the harm was, how sad I really was. I had already attempted suicide once. He, he knew that, but he wanted to wash over that and make that me being a, a little spoiled brat wanting my way. And he, he whitewashed over all of the abuse which I had seen two of my other sisters be physically abused and in marriages in marriages. And my dad, you know, he was angry about it, but he never like really did anything. Like I, I, he tried to rescue one of my sisters. I, I have to say, but you know, he just basically said, go back and be happy and stop being sad. And so as part of that, like, he had been abusive himself or as part of that, it's just like, oh, this is the way the world is. Or is part of that, like, like yeah. the pregnancy, it's just like, we don't need this stuff in our lives. Right. I'd rather just go figure it out, but I go don't want Go figure wanna, it out. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want to look at this and, you know, just go. Yeah. I just don't think he wanted to deal with it. He didn't want to see another divorce. You know, he'd already, there had been my, my brother, my oldest sister and my my well, there'd been four divorces already in our family by the time it came to me. Oh, okay. So he was like, you know, please, not another. So I got sent back home, and I. That's we went, a lot of divorces, especially since he and his wife were pretty happy. I know, and that's why I asked John. John's a psychologist. I think he says that we had an unrealistic, idealistic view of marriage. We didn't see conflict between them, really. We saw two giddy, lovey-dovey people who were crazy about each other, and we didn't really get it. When you didn't experience that, you're like, something's wrong. Yeah. Our we're marriages like, are broken. Right. They're not and like our parents. Leave. Yeah. Mm. So he thinks we were unprepared for it. So you go back after two kids because yeah. the Lord tells you to through your dad. Right. And I was angry about it. I was not happy. Not at all. I went back miserable. I stayed, I stayed, I stayed. I had more children. Um, I went into bishops. I told them that I was miserable. What do I do? And they basically just said, well, ask your dad. Your dad's a GA. <laughs> you know, they, they didn't know what to say mm. to me. Mm. So what was your ex-husband's profession? He was a computer software, um, a CEO. Of a, he had several different ones, but that was the main one that he did. Of and, a software company. And where were you live? What states we're were you in? We're living in Provo most of the time. Most of the time you're in Provo. Yeah. Oh, well, that's he, he nice. drove up to Salt that's Lake. That's rich. Utah County. Yeah. Utah <laughs> County. Silicon Valley. He drove up to Salt Lake almost every day for work. Okay. Uh, so, um, yeah, I wasn't happy at all. I was very, I was miserable and I was not, you know, I just wasn't flourishing there at all. Um, continued to have kids. Um, kind of threw myself into, I was, I had art background and I was kind of uh, craftsy and I made things and sold them, painted and sold. You know, I did a lot of sewing for people. I, I tried to keep myself occupied and busy so that I would be, you know, happy, as happy as I could be in a marriage that was really difficult for me. And I, I don't want to, I don't, like I said, I don't want to make it about him because I know that our personalities just did not mesh well. He would have been really happy with my sister, Laura. They would have been perfect together. They loved each other until he died. You know, I mean, they adored each other. They were more su better suited. I'm just a little fi more fiery and he could not handle that. It just infuriated him. So we did have a hard time. And uh, so I don't know where you want to meet. Now, uh, do you want me to So go you were married how many divorce? years? How many 33. Years? 33 years in a relationship that was either abusive or toxic. Hard. And Hard. was he, he serving he in bishoprics? Being... Was, he, was he... Oh, yeah. Yeah, he was you in bishoprics. were serving in Relief Society yeah. or whatever and all the calling. I was gospel and... doctrine teacher for a long time. I was Relief Society, you know, teacher for a long time. Young women. He was always in either a bishopric or young men's. You know, he's always very active. And um, you had how many kids? Seven. Seven kids. Yeah. And I then know. what's it like in those last 10 years when 
What's it like being in a marriage that's just not good for either of you? Oh, man. It was hard. Yeah. I, I got to a point. I mean, I got to a point where I refused to go to a romantic comedy. I wouldn't listen to romantic music. If anything was spoken about marriage or love, I wouldn't listen. I had to I'd turn it off because I would end up bawling. And, and I cried. I, I cried every day for like 10 years straight for like an hour or two. I used to get colored contacts and the acid in my tears would go right through them. And I'd, I'd have to throw them away because I could not stop crying. And my kids knew it. They could hear, you know, they knew we were fighting all the time. Um, it was hard. And, and, you know, both of us were good people. We just were a bad combination, yeah. you know. You must so. be intensely lonely. There's that Robin Williams quote that yeah. some people think the worst thing possible is to be alone. But he says the worst thing possible is to feel alone while you're with someone. While you're with someone. Is that right? Is that I would experience? agree with that because yeah. I've had both now, you know. Yeah. That was hard. Um, you mind if I get a drink? No. No, no, no. So um, I, you know, the whole time I kept saying to him, don't you think we should just go separate ways? Don't you think, you know, you're not happy. I'm not happy. Don't you think we should just move on? And, you know, his answer was no. We're supposed to work. You know, we were married in the temple. We took these covenants. My patriarchal blessing says that I'm supposed to honor, support, and keep my wife. And he said, so I'm not letting you end this. And then if I pushed on it, he would threaten me. I'll get the kids. I'll make your life miserable. You'll wish. Because he had money. A little. Yeah. We had enough. We didn't have a lot of money, but we had, we had enough where he could make me feel like I'd be out on my own. I'd be a waitress for the rest of my life. And Because you, you never got your education right. and developed your career, any of that. Exactly. So and I believed him. And I didn't have the guts to do anything about it. I didn't have a job. You know, I took on little jobs. So I was a waitress for a while. I I'd sewed. I painted. I, I did things like that. But I, I wasn't making enough money. Did you ever feel myself. bad that your dad didn't help you? And Like, sometimes a child wants their dad to protect them and yeah. help them and save them. He and my husband were best friends. That wasn't going to happen. Mm. They were buds. And no, he just wasn't, that wasn't going to happen for mm. me. And I knew it. Mm. And my mom wasn't going to do anything either. So I didn't, I didn't talk to my parents anymore. I stopped talking to them. I stopped going to my bishop. I stopped all of that. And the next, uh, the last probably 15 years of my marriage, I just buckled down and decided this is my life. Um, I'm just going to, you know, some people don't have, some people never get married. Some people are born without limbs. I need to just be grateful that I have what I have and be happy, you know. And then I had a near-death experience. And that is kind of a turning point for me, one of the turning points. So, yeah. and, and I don't talk about this very much, but once in a while, um, and this happened shortly after my brother Dan passed away. So it was around 2003. I... Um, I was sick and I overdosed by accident on too much pseudoephedrine and I, I died basically. Um, so I was at home and laying in bed and I just nursed my baby and put him down and my husband said, I told him, I said, my heart's going crazy. It's going crazy. It's going to bounce right out of my chest because I had all this pseudoephedrine in me. And I didn't know anything about pseudoephedrine. I didn't know what it did. All I knew was I was miserable. I had a really bad cold. And I took this stuff. And uh, um, and I, the next thing I knew, I was outside of my body, up on the ceiling, looking down at myself in the bed. And I realized I'm, I died. Like, I just knew it. And I sat up there for a minute, and my husband came in the room and tried to revive me and I saw that and then I had this experience and it's something that I I don't talk about in detail because it's really mine you know it's just like I'm not supposed to go out and write a book I'm not supposed to get talk about it you know and and, and write about it or it's kind of my personal experience but 
Daniel, my brother, who had passed away only a few months before, was there. And he came and took my hand, and, and we left. And we did this, we went on this journey, and um, one thing that was very clear to me was there was no mention whatsoever of the church. Nothing. Not even in passing, like, hey, you know that church you were a member of? That's not true. Or, hey, you know, here's Nephi, or, you know, nothing was mentioned. So I came back. I was given the choice to come back or not. And when I did choose to because I had a baby, I knew I needed to go back, even though I had been praying to die for years. Like, it was a nightly prayer. So, I mean, sorry, I don't want to get emotional, but when that happened to me, I felt like God said, okay, you want to die, you can die, and, and we'll give you that. You get, to, you get to do that if that's what you want. This is how I thought at the time. And I did, and I came back home because I needed to be there for my son. So it was a choice that I made to come back. And when I came back, I had this euphoric, and it was really painful coming back, but that's a whole other experience. But when I was back in and I was back awake and the paramedics were there and they were running tests on me and they whisked me to the hospital and I was in the hospital for two weeks and they did a, put a defibrillator pacemaker in my chest, which is still here. And my heart was enlarged and, you know, I was really in trouble for a while. And uh, I had this euphoric feeling that there was a purpose to my life and that I needed to be here and there were things that I needed to do still. And I had a happy feeling about it for the first time in years and years. I felt positive. And um, I told, you know, I told my family, I said, you know, I just went through something and it was really transformative. And the things that we think are important here, none of them are important. What you drive, what you what house you live in, what, you know, money, none of it matters. None of it matters. All that matters is how do we love people? How do we treat people? Do we care for people? Do we sacrifice for people? Um, it's all about that. And it's not just me, 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 you know. And, and I had nothing to tell them about the gospel other than that. That to me was the pure gospel. And I realized that it didn't matter whether you went to the temple. It didn't matter whether you were baptized or not. It didn't matter any of that. If you kept the word of wisdom, it didn't matter. None of that mattered. All that mattered was how you treat people. And that was the end of it. It was love, basically. And so that was like the beginning of a transition that took place inside of me. And it was subtle at first because I didn't really know how that, what to do with my religion, what to do with all that. And what year was this? This is 2003. So this is seven years ago, six or seven years ago, mm -hmm. you were in your. No, this is more than that. It's 2003, it's seven, it's 17 years ago. 17 years ago. Sorry. Yeah. My math, I, I missed no, it's a decade. Okay. okay. Missed the decade. So 17 years ago. Yeah. You were around how old? I was. I'm not trying to. Forty. Just trying to. Two. Get, okay. Forty. Yeah. Forties. Yeah. And when that when that happened, thank you for sharing something mm -hmm. so personal. When that happened, were you sure that that I mean that tells you a couple things that tells you that if you take it literally versus just some dream or yeah you know well I know there's scientific excuses about it. And I'm not trying They'll to mess say it's with that. Brain activity or, I'm just you know. saying, when you awoke, yeah, that would have confirmed to you that you have a spirit, right? That the spirit can that leave the body, after. yeah. That your brother is alive as a spirit, right? That there's a whole heaven, like you would, you you believe that before, mm -hmm. but that would have, I imagine, you would have then experienced that as yeah. as legitimizing uh -huh. some of some of the things that you had already believed, right? Right. Heaven, spirits. Yeah. You know. But that's it. But then none of the Mormon stuff. Yeah. Okay. None of the Mormon stuff. Okay. Right. Okay. But that's – and of course there's people questioning whether NDEs are real or right. just all in your brain. I know. And, 
And okay. that's, you know, and the jury's out on that. I might have just had a fantastic dream. Oh, so you're open to that? Yeah. Okay, okay. I am because I, you know, <laughs> all I know, I know what I have felt. I know what I experienced. But that could have been my brain doing stuff to me. I don't know. Okay. Okay. But it seemed very real to me. I mean, I saw myself on the bed I, from that vantage point. You know, you don't get that vantage point. Well, maybe. I guess you could dream that. I, I'm just going to say uh, that I, I passed out once in high school on the bathroom floor. And my memory is that I saw my, my body from like the corner, top corner of, a, really? of the bathroom. Yeah. My memory is that that's what you remember. My spirit was hovering in the corner and could see right. my body. I, right. I don't know what that means, but I, I do have that memory. Yeah. I could have made it up, but I have that memory. Right. And, and same for me. Yeah. Like maybe so I'm I manufacturing that. it, yeah. but that is what I remember. Yeah. Okay. And I, I have other memories that are tied to this. That, and it felt like a lot of time passed. And they said it was six minutes. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so.